Welcome to Lunch with Books and Lunch with Books live stream. Uh, we're back again. This is our third uh, in-person gathering since uh, the, the thing we don't speak of anymore. If you would uh, please at this time turn off your cell phones. Uh, I'll just tell you about the next couple of programs. Now this Thursday we, we are doing a series on insects and entomology. We have two classes left, the one on July 8th at 6.30, and those have to be online because our instructors, in this case, she's in Colorado. Um, uh, we will do Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, metamorphosis migrations and monitoring, and our instructor's name is Catherine Hoham. She is the former Lepidoptera at the Buffalo, that's the Buffalo, the butterfly at the Billion in Colorado. And an entomologist at the Houston Museum of Math and Science. So she's all about tracking the monarch butterflies and things like that. She'll tell you all about, all about that. And then the next day, we have two classes in a row, not classes, but two programs in a row that are live streaming of books before we do when this one's going to end. So uh, this person is in Hampshire and the left of that is in Colorado again. Uh, so they'll be online only, and that's the last of the live stream other than. The last people's university. Uh, her name is uh, Dr. John Prescott. I want to see she could be here in person. But she's a physicist and she wrote a book called The Disordered Cosmos. And uh, it's described as, uh, let me read it to you. Shares the love, love of physics from the same model of particle physics and love of the beyond the physics of the melanin in the skin to the latest series of dark matter. All of the sin formed by history, politics, and the wisdom of Star Wars. She is the uh, one of the few that have been on the higher and the PhD on the any part of physics. The vision of Cosmos is vibrant, pointed, non traditional, and grounded in wide feminist traditions. So that's an interesting combination. She was recommended by the Star Wars for me, the chess champion who did a program for us. They're a good friend of mine. So that will be a Now today, as you can see, we have a very interesting set of green cards. We're doing special programs with the staff that we're doing the actor, who is part of our reference staff. And uh, he's an insect enthusiast. I'm not going to waste so much time. But one of the specialties is what we have here today. We decided, what the heck, we'll just have a man the library. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. I'm going to tune in after the state of the It'll just be a black screen. Because he does it every day and night. Just like a black screen. But most of the time, we watch the movie and the movie. And 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 the movie uh, I'll probably we'll start here with um, talking a little, a little bit, bit uh, about uh, some different things I'll say already in my First of all, I apologize. I will not be taking her out of her closure to bring her out. Um, she's actually getting ready to molt at the moment. Uh, and when they are getting ready to molt, which is that they shed their exoskeleton for a new one because they have grown too large for their current exoskeleton. Uh, when you're getting ready to molt, really don't want to interrupt them or else they might roll poorly or have an accident. Uh, that's not usually something that they can survive. So I'm not going to be removing her from her enclosure this time. Um, but there will be opportunities uh, going forward when we have her upstairs that if you happen to ask and I'm not busy, I can absolutely take her out of her enclosure and let you hand her and whatnot. Um, so I've been Keeping mantises for about six years uh, and studying them for about that time or longer. Uh, and I have been personally uh, invested in them since I was a very young child. Uh, I, I moved to Wheeling in uh, third grade, didn't have a lot of friends, uh, but there was this very, very big female mantis in my backyard. She was very docile. She loved to hold her. She loved to feed her. I, 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 I never once snapped my finger or anything. 
She was my best friend. From that point on, I pretty much loved this species of insects. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to open up with that. that. Uh, one thing also, um, a lot of the information that I know comes from a book called Keeping the Brain Mantis by Oren Nava McMahon. Uh, it, basically, this book, uh, I absolutely highly suggest it if you are curious about them. Um, this book collects a lot of the research and a lot of the scientific papers and a lot of the things that uh, entomologists and hobbyists of all research and learn about mantises and kind of collecting them all in one single book. Uh, it's incredibly informative, but I highly suggest it. Um, I'm sorry. We had a, someone online said there was a problem with the sound, but I, I can listen on my, oh, on my phone, so it's fine. No, oh, it's no. okay. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah. So, yeah. And so, yeah. And so, yeah. And so, uh, when I had uh, uh, last uh, time, I saw a few of uh, uh, some uh, of my favorite, uh, some of my favorite uh, names of articles and uh, 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 their uh, authors. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm you know, really curious about some of the research that I have. I can provide it. So, yeah. I'd like to open it up to any questions. That anyone may have. have. <laughs> we saw a lot of praying in the emphasis here, but now they're now they're really little in Bethlehem. We see a lot of walking sticks. Yes. Is that the name of it? Yeah, the stick bugs, bugs, walking sticks. Yeah. Well, they have a lot of different names. Any reason for that, or it's just the area? It's the habitat. Uh, mantises excel in uh, places with a lot of brush, uh, with a lot of um, trees, a lot of places where they can hide. They're ambush predators, um, mostly. Uh, they aren't always just still and waiting for something to come on by. They'll change their location uh, and sometimes even hunt actively. Um, uh, so yeah, it really just depends on the the environment. They, they're going to favor particular environments. You're going to find them, like I said, a lot more in, in brush um, and trees. Uh, if, if you happen to have a garden, they're going to uh, be attracted to gardens. Uh, it really just depends on, is there prey here? <laughs> is, there, is there something for them to eat? And if there is, they're going to be there. Really depends by species. The ones that we have here uh, in the Ohio County area um, are technically an invasive species. We have, uh, they're called Chinese mantises or uh, giant Asian mantises. Um, uh, I believe the scientific name is Tenodora sinensis. Could be remembering the name wrong. If I, if I am, I apologize. Um, they obviously do not originate, originate from the States. Uh, the United States, uh, North America specifically, only has a few different species of uh, indigenous, man indigenous mantis. Um, the uh, Carolina mantis is the more famous of them. Uh, the, and that one is only pretty much indigenous to the uh, southeast uh, United States and southeast, southeast uh, North America. Um, however, the giant Asian mantis, uh, as well as a species, uh, uh, the European mantis, uh, both of these are better in the in, in the environments that North America's indigenous mantises were. So they took a lot of territory and hunted and ate uh, our indigenous mantises. And they've, but, and they've been around for so long, though, that they're basically indigenous, but they didn't originate from here. Um, and the giant Asian mantis, the, the ones that we're talking about here, uh, they they will grow four to eight inches long. Oh yeah, uh, uh, she is she yeah she's a baby she's a nymph. Um, mantises don't so you know how moths and. Uh, Butterflies and the like will go through uh, various metamorphoses. Uh, mantises don't. Uh, their metamorphosis is essentially their molts. Um, and she's only molted 
I'd say about two or three times. They're mostly going to molt six to eight times, depending on the species, uh, before they'll actually have their wings. Uh, when they're nymphs, when they're uh, when they're babies, basically, uh, they won't have wings. They can't fly. They can run around real fast, but they can't fly. How, how big will she be as an adult? She'll be probably about six inches. Big. Uh, a lot of um, her species will be. Um, and at that point, she could eat a human being. I mean, she could catch your finger and take a bite. Um, she does. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Uh, they rarely do. Um, only if you if you happen to keep one and you are being uh, irresponsible, uh, you might get caught and bit. They'll let go though. Uh, there's actually uh, a reason for that, um, which I learned quite recently. Uh, and also, I can even cite the article. The article is um, "Aversive Learning in the Praying Mantis" uh, by Robert. Berto uh, Battison uh, and several others. Uh, this particular, this particular one uh, is this particular, this particular research goes into uh, how they will stop eating something that they don't like. So if they catch something and it tastes bitter, that's the other thing that's brought up here is bitterness is not favored in a lot of. Uh, small prey animals. Bitterness is usually indicative of poison. Um, so if they happen to catch something and it's bitter, they won't eat that thing ever again. It can be in front of their face. It can be in their in, in their enclosure. It could be the only thing that they could possibly find to eat. They will never eat it if it tastes bitter. Human blood is bitter. <laughs> so if a mantis ever happens to bite you, um, or chew and draw blood, they will let you go because you taste bitter. Um, so you're never really at risk for, of them uh, doing much more than drawing blood once, because as soon as they taste it, they're going to let go, and they're never going to consider you edible ever again. Yes? I don't ever remember seeing a, a, a mantis that's big enough to, to, draw, to draw blood. I mean, that's the mm. first one. The second part of that, though, is that they see the ones that, that I've encountered seem to be very awesome. Yes, they are. That there's, no, uh, there's very little aggression. It's more of a, hey, I want to get out of here. But, but they, will, they will let you hold them. They'll sit on your hand. There's actually a really good reason for that. Um, there is a long-held... Uh, myth that it's illegal to kill them. Uh, that myth's actually been around since like the mid, the early, early to mid um, 1900s. Uh, so consequently, because most people have thought that it's illegal to kill them, no one's ever really harmed them. So what it's kind of led to is sort of like what happened with, uh, a good example is um, like the dodo bird. Dodo bird never had any reason to distrust humans. So they never fled from them. You, know, you could go and pet them and whatnot. Mantises have not gone the way of the dodo, of course. But uh, because they have very little reason to fear people, they don't. Um, the second thing, though, uh, people, their food is usually around people. So you know, we have lights. We have like lights outside. We have you know stuff in our in our backyards. We have gardens. Uh, we have a lot of things that attract other insects and attract their prey animals. So humans are as beneficial to mantises as mantises are to us. So they they, they tend to be very very docile, uh, almost kind of trusting. I've had ones that I've kept that were not like that. Individual personality is taken into account. I've had I've had one before that. Uh, didn't really like to be held more than just a few minutes. He wanted to be picked up. He would alert me that he wants to be picked up, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, and then I'll pick him up. A few minutes later, he's getting angry. He's raising his forelimbs. He's getting really aggressive. Put him back. <laughs> uh, which does bring me to a thing I also want to talk about um, is communication. 
this is a this is something that fascinates me with this particular uh, with, with these insects, um, and it is not very well researched outside of a few different species. Uh, in my experiences, they are communicative based on if it gets them what they want. Um, they will learn if you happen to hold them frequently and if you are hand feeding them especially. That's one of the things that I've noticed. Uh, if they associate your hand with food and comfort, they will want your hand around. They can't recognize your face. They only know you by your hand. You basically may as well be a giant mountain with a hand that moves around, as far as they're concerned. Um, so they're only going to recognize your hand, maybe your arm. Uh, but uh, they'll tell the difference between your hands if you know you hand feed them or hold them often enough, uh, and they'll trust certain hands. Uh, and one of the things that I've experienced is. Um, them learning how to get my attention, mostly by making noise. Uh, the, mo the most common one that I have found is uh, tapping on the side of their enclosure. They'll use their raptorial forearms, they'll use the little tips of them that they would normally use to hold on to prey, they'll use them to tap on the glass. And that, obviously, because they're making a noise, gets me to look at them and either see if they have food. Do they, do, do they have food? Okay, yeah, they have food. Is their enclosure dirty? Do they want me to clean it? No, it's fine. Okay, they probably just want to come out for a little bit. Sort of like trying to interpret what a cat wants when they meow. First thing check, food. Second thing, litter. Last, all right, pets. <laughs> um, I think there was a question back there. Okay. So, that also is dependent on species, but it's between six months to about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah, they're 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 very short lived. Um, the one that's the shortest lived that I know of is the orchid mantis, which is a huge shame. They're one of the most beautiful creatures in the whole world, um, but they only live about six months. Um, the ones that we have, the Tendora species. Uh, they tend to live um, about a year. Uh, they can live longer than a year, but I don't like the way that you keep them living that long. You actually kind of have to like intermittently starve them to, to keep them for longer than a year, and it's kind of rude. I don't. I don't want to. I don't. I don't like the idea of doing that to them because um, the thing is, they they have very very fast metabolisms. And the more that they're digesting, the more often they're eating. Well, firstly, they're going to be happier if they're eating very often, but uh, their metabolism is going to run their lifespan up faster. So if they're not eating as much, they're going to live a lot longer. But like I said, I think that's a kind of rude thing to do to something that's depending on you for food, shelter, etc. cetera. Um, so I've never actually done that for humans too. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, no, probably not. I think humans will have a natural lifespan dependent, but still also very rude to just intermittently starve them. I did to myself. <laughs> um, maybe talk about their intelligence and because you talked about socialization. Yes. How their brains work. Um, so one of the things with, with mantises uh, and also just in general a lot of insects, uh, they have I like to call them body brains, uh, where it's less of a central nervous system and more um, col a collection of nodes throughout the body that controls different things. Uh, like uh, mantises, for instance, um, they have three major nodes and then ganglia spread about. And the ganglia is going to, the ganglia is the same, effectively for them is the same as their central nervous system, just more spread out and not just in like one small, location. A uh, reason for this for a lot of insects is they have such small bodies. Um, insects need to do as much with their little space as possible. 
Um, so any way to squeeze more efficiency into their small frames, the better. Um, so in the case of intelligence for mantises, in the case of their brains specifically, you have a lot of the personality and inhibitions that's going to be stored in the head area. Uh, you have um, movement and uh, uh, movement and digestion is kind of in the center and in the lower area. Um, and uh, I believe hearing, if I remember correctly, is in the center area. Uh, and then other particular uh, operations are going to be spread out through the ganglia. Um, and yeah, sorry. Uh, the, one of the things that I find really fascinating about them in respect to this uh, is how they store memories or the fact that they store memories at all. Um, I grew up thinking that insects in general were just biological machines. You could predict what they're going to do. You give a you give a cricket some something to eat over on this side of the cage. They're going to walk the same path to get to them. They're always going to do the same thing. All of them are the same, uh, and we're kind of taught that. Or when I was in high school, also college, we were kind of taught that same thing. It's actually not true. A lot of insects are capable of an individual experience. Uh, they're capable of developing preferences that are capable of developing memories. As I mentioned earlier, for instance, um, about the aversive learning, they, because they know that this thing is bitter, because they associate its image, like the actual appearance of it, uh, possibly even the sound it makes with bitterness, it won't eat them. Uh, it will, they will also, Learn locations. There's a really, really good one that was uh, kind of baffling to the scientific community for a while. Um, I, by, I, oh, sorry, actually, I was wrong about something. I may have, when I cited the aversive learning, I was actually Thomas Carl and several others. Robert, uh, Roberto Batteson is the one who wrote this one. Uh, the fishing mantid is what the, uh, is the, the article is uh, titled. Um, this, the, this in particular, uh, this article in particular happens to deal with the fact that the, the author, uh, Baddison, um, for several nights in a row, uh, he saw one large mantis that came to his pond, his little, his little pond that he had built outside of his, his door, and ate his guppies that had never been seen in the wild before. Their sight, the way that they perceive things and uh, guess distances, is not conducive to eating guppies. There is no reason that they would have done this, except this mantis learned that it could, and it learned that there was nothing really stopping it. There, was no, there were no predators around. There was nothing competing with it. So every single night, this mantis went to this guy's pond and ate his guppies. It learned that this is a good place to hunt. Um, and it learned that guppies didn't taste bitter and to them are probably quite delicious. Uh, so that's just, a, that's, that's just a, a few examples of um, learning and uh, problem solving for them. I put a question from the audience. Yes. Uh, do praying mantis, praying mantises have eyelids? They have huge eyes, but can they blink? Uh, the answer to that question is no, they don't have eyelids. Um, they actually have five eyes. Uh, you've seen, the, you've seen their, their faces with those like two bulb, bulbous eyes on their, like the top of their triangular heads. Um, those are compound eyes. They're not focus eyes. They're a ton, a ton, a ton of uh, tiny lenses formed into a spherical shape. Um, and that lets them get peripheral vision all around them. So it's basically like having you know something over here in the corner of your eye that you're not focusing on, but you can kind of see it, except all around their head. What they have for focus um, is 
they have these three tiny little eyes that are focus lenses that are right between their large compound eyes. And those focus lenses are what they use to do what we do when we look directly at something or, or, or someone um, not really focusing on our peripheral. Uh, so whenever they are looking at someone or looking at something, they will croon their head over and they will face it mostly so that their focal eyes can see them. So if you ever happen to see one that is like, that is looking flat at you, not like their head is flat facing you, they're focusing on you. If they're looking up, like their head is kind of fo focusing up, they're looking up somewhere up here. Now, you talked about one of the myths that you can't kill the mantis. Mm -hmm. There's another persistent myth. Do any of you remember something you've learned about and that you always associate with praying mantis when they mate? Okay. That's something I really wanted to talk about. Uh, it's called sexual cannibalism. Um, it was a uh, it was a very very pervasive myth um, that actually resulted from one really bad study. Uh, this study was focused on you know, their their mating habits and what. The, what, what the scientists did in this study was they basically, and this study has been replicated time and time again um, and proven as what it will do. And basically, if you take a male and female mantis and you put them in an unfamiliar environment and you watch what they do, the female is going to eat the male. The male will try to mate, probably, but the female is going to eat the male. Um, like I said, they're in an unfamiliar environment, they're stressed, the female's probably hungry, uh, and the male isn't communicating with her. So, she bites his head off. Uh, this can happen in the wild, too, but it's incredibly rare. The males are usually really intelligent about this, they'll wait for the female to eat, and also they'll communicate with her in some way. Uh, there's been a lot of different uh, documented ways that they communicate. Uh, I think the one that's most impressive to me is the boxer mantis. Uh, the boxer mantis has a call and response way of communicating with, uh, with uh, females. Um, the, the, they will use their forelegs, so their forelimbs, and they will effectively, they will kind of essentially do this sort of dance where they will move their arms or their, 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 their forelimbs uh, in a way that seems dance-like. Um, and every species that does this has a different way of doing it. Uh, the boxer does it in a particular way where they show their undersides of their forelimbs because they're incredibly colorful. Uh, and they have a wide range of motion with their forelimbs that is conducive to communication. Um, the boxers, uh, boxer mantises are some of the most communicative ones that we know of. Um, and when they do this particular courtship ritual, basically, uh, this, this particular dance, uh, if the female is interested, she'll allow it. Um, male will only approach, though, if she's eaten. They're usually very perceptive about these things. Because the female is hungry, doesn't matter what he does, she's gonna eat him. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's always gonna be the case if she is hungry. Um, so obviously in the wild, like I said, the male waits for her to eat. Uh, but there are cases where it happens in the wild and she has already eaten. Um, that's usually indicative of an unhealthy female. She is sick, uh, she is naturally stressed for some reason, uh, or uh, she has a parasite, for instance, that is consuming a lot of her nutrients. Um, so she'll be constantly hungry even after she's eaten. Uh, and one of the articles I read um, was that 30% uh, of the mantises studied uh, Let's see, it was, 
in the Zoological Journal of, Line of the Linnean Society. Uh, did a 2006 article, uh, research article on it um, that dealt with the sexual cannibalism uh, details, uh, specifically in um, specifically in uh, Indian the Indian mantis. Uh, but there was another one that I read. I don't actually have the name of that article on me at the moment. Um, but I can, if anyone's interested, I can go ahead and get the name after this is done. Uh, they did a, they did a uh, study on Chinese mantises. Um, well, the one on Indian mantises here talked. They 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 uh, focused a lot on um, their communicative behavior between each other, uh, basically to identify each other as the same species, to prevent cannibalism, and to uh, identify what their intentions. were. Uh, there was one as well on the Chinese mantis, the giant Asian mantis, like what we have here. Um, and I was unable to find a video on it, but it sounds, it sounds very, uh, delightful. Uh, they have a particular, uh, mutual dance where, uh, they will use their wings, they will use their forelimbs, um, and they will approach each other and rub their antennae upon each other. It, it sounds like, it, basically from everything I've read about that, it sounds very, uh, it sounds very personal. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of, as, as uh, part of the, uh, the, the uh, debunking of the uh, sexual cannibalism. We have There's another, another question. question here. Is the pointy end of their head a nose or tongue or neither? I imagine they're talking about the bottom of the triangle, uh, the, like their triangle head. Um, that's their mouth. They don't have a nose. They don't have lungs, so they don't have a need for a nose. Um, they get all of their uh, olfactory senses with their mouth. Um, they don't necessarily have a tongue either. Uh, they have a their their system of mandibles, uh, their, like their mouth, uh, is kind of bizarre. A little scary if you look at it too closely. <laughs> uh, they have um, four or more little, almost finger-like appendages. appendages. Uh, on the uh, area of their mouth that they will actually use to drag food in. And then they'll have uh, a hard, um, almost beak-like uh, uh, like organ uh, inside of their mouth that will crunch up food. Um, so they'll use their forelimbs that they catch something with, and then they'll use those vaguely finger-like appendages that are that's around their mouth. Um, between those, they will drag the food in for consumption. Uh, I also, not to go on the tangent here, but I also mentioned the thing about lungs. They don't have those. So they don't have noses either. Um, what they have are, uh, they have specialized pores along the back side, the, the back middle side of their bodies uh, and their legs as well. Uh, and these pores, there's uh, one side of their body has these pores, and then the other side of the body has the opposite pores. And basically what this does is it takes in air from one side of the body, it expels the air on the other side. And then, some specialized, with, 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 when their cells are specialized, all the oxygen that goes through just goes straight up, straight up and down through, throughout the rest of their body. Basically, is streamlining the idea of lungs and the idea of a circulatory system using, uh, as I said before, uh, making the most efficient use of the tiny space that they have. Uh, let's see, I live in Virginia. Where could I find one to observe? Any field. Gardens, especially gardens, are really, really great to find mantises. Um, any field, any place with brush, any place uh, that's along the edge of a forest. Um, 
if you could, if you look at it and you see a lot of insects and you can and think to yourself, if I were an ambush predator, I would totally hide here and catch things. Probably is going to be where you find them. Um, they can be hard to find sometimes, uh, just by virtue of the fact that they will change their color as they as they age to accommodate their environment. Um, like for instance, uh, this little lady right here uh, is turning green. When we got her, she was like a neutral light brown color. And if we had kept her in an enclosure that had mostly just brown objects, like brown sticks, things along those lines, she would have darkened that color and gone more to the side of having a brown coat to her skeleton. Um, but because we have these green fake leaves in there, uh, she associates that as this is how this is what color she should be so that her prey doesn't see her and she has an easier time sneaking up on them or her prey is going to be dumb and walk right by um so consequently sometimes it can be hard to find them um just have to look closely sometimes but one of i used to um catching when I was a kid. I haven't seen one in years in a while. Um, when I fed them, they always eat the head first. Why is, is there a reason for that? Uh, to lower the possibility that they can fight back. Is that uh, it? Yeah, mantises eat live food. Um, you can teach them sort of to eat uh, steak, like uncooked steak that's raw and not frozen. Um, if you do that, unfortunately, they will stop hunting. Yeah, so there, there, there have been people that have kept them in captivity that that fed them raw steak. What they would do is they would put steak on a string and then put that, in, that string in their enclosure. And eventually, the mantises learned that they could eat that and that it wasn't bitter. Um, and so they stopped hunting. They would only eat that from that point on after they got used to it. Uh, but um, for a live prey, which is the, which is what they prefer. Uh, they'll eat the head first because the head has mandibles or the head uh, generally has something that can be used to bite their forelimbs or bite them right back. Um, and a lot of insects too, uh, their motor control is in the head as well, or at the very least the, it's the head to like the middle area of their bodies or their motor control is. So if the mantis eats those first, uh, they won't be able to move their limbs anymore. Um, grasshoppers, for instance, grasshoppers are really dangerous sometimes um, because if they catch a grasshopper on the side of something and the grasshopper can actually get its uh, jumping legs in position, it can actually leap itself with the mantis. <laughs> uh, and that can be kind of dangerous. Um, but uh, for the sake of uh, crickets, um, for instance, uh, or a good example, crickets, when, if they eat them from the bottom up, uh, crickets have really, really strong jaws. They can, if they work hard enough, they can get through most things. Uh, they will absolutely take chunks out of uh, something that's trying to eat them um, if they're able to get their mandibles on it. Uh, so for reasons like that, Max always goes for the head. Yes. So, what are the predators of the mantis? Birds, large birds, specifically hawks. Um, bats do as well, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, and small mammals. Uh, and the uh, the small mammals, so like raccoons, um, possums, things like those. Uh, it's actually theorized that mantises are able to hear because of flying uh, predators. Um, they have a specialized hearing organ uh, that is between their uh, middle and lowest set of legs. Um, and that specialized hearing organ, uh, it doesn't, they are not really, really able to hear um, and uh, three dimensions. 
uh, is the best way of putting it. They can't hear that, like, you're right there. They wouldn't be able to tell if you're right there or right there or, or back here. They would just know that you're here. Um, so if a bat happens to make an echolocation noise, the mantis knows to hide. Or if, there, if a hawk happens to make uh, a cry or uh, any, any uh, bird that would hunt them happens to make any noises, they know to act like a leaf or act like a stick or get under something. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, consequently earlier, I was mentioning to Sean, this is probably the most noise that she's heard <laughs> in forever, uh, which is fine. She seems like she's doing okay. Um, let's see, are there any prey larger than guppies that, that mantids have been recorded eating? Yes, hummingbirds. Uh, mantids have been known to eat hummingbirds. So if you happen to have bird feeders uh, and there are uh, especially large mantids around, they might eat your hummingbirds. Might. Uh, uh, it's, it's not especially common, but they have been, they, they have been known to uh, catch uh, small birds like that and eat them whole. Pretty e e every piece of them. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> there are a lot of videos on it, uh, and just be wary if you happen to look them up. It's pretty gross, um, and you'll have a lot of comments that you can read of people being disgusted and mortified by it. Stuff of nightmare. It kind of is. <laughs> so does anyone else have? Karen okay. has a question. Karen? No, I was just when they do, mm -hmm. they have What's that? Yeah, they, they have, they, uh, most have wings. Um, and they can fly. Yeah, most have wings and they can fly. Now, their flight is um, not graceful at all. When you, when you look at them and you see them, you know, wobbling or something, they look kind of graceful where, where they stand. When they fly, the least graceful thing in the world. They fly in a direction and they have very limited control of how, of how they're flying and what they're gonna hit. Uh, so they just kind of use their wings to propel themselves in a direction that they sort of wanna to go to. Um, they rarely are able to catch themselves on something. So if you happen to have one in captivity and you have it out, it's fully grown, it's a fully grown adult, they, they have their wings and they decide that they wanna to go to the ceiling they're more likely to just kind of bounce off of the ceiling and fall than they are to actually catch themselves onto the ceiling because they have very limited uh, dexterity when they're flying. It's, it's, kind of, it, uh, it's kind of a way to escape predators in a last ditch effort, um, but also a, a way of migrating. It's classy, sally, happy in Let's ask her. <laughs> uh, it's hard to tell. As long as they have food, as long as they have food, that the uh, their environment's warm, um, and that their environment is humid, they're good. And it's a very dangerous world. Out there. They die off there. Apparently. Um, Sally will live the winter. Right yes. In the warmth of the library. Uh, that's why uh, in captivity, that's when they can live a year or longer. Um, in the wild, uh, they hatch, or they'll, they'll, they'll come out of their egg sacs called ooths. Uh, they'll come out of their ooths and uh, by like the uh, dozens to hundreds. Uh, and they'll do that in spring. They will grow throughout summer. They will mate in fall and then lay their, and then the female will lay her ooths. They'll die off as winter comes, and the next spring those youth hatch. So that's kind of their their whole circle of life, uh, and they just do that repeatedly. In captivity, because you can control the uh, how warm it's going to be, um, you can keep them for a lot longer. Like the cold will not be killing them off. Uh, all of the ones that that I have had uh, that lived past all their molts and lived into adulthood. They all basically died of old age. 
and she gets a lot of interaction. So, I mean, the socialization. Yeah, there. we we take her out of the, the uh, her enclosure almost every day, every other day. Um, we get people to hold her, uh, handle her, get her used to humans. Um, the more that you handle them, um, the more they'll understand that humans will not hurt them. Uh, and also that humans are warm. Sometimes humans are sweaty, so they're kind of humid. Uh, all the things that most pantheists really like. So um, that's why I said that uh, sometimes I'll have them and they'll learn to get my attention uh, not because they want food, already have plenty, not because they want, they're, they're stressed for their, their cages dirty or something, uh, but because they want to be held, because your hand is incredibly warm uh, and you may be giving off a little bit of humidity. Uh, the, how do you distinguish between a Chinese versus European mantis? And can they be found all over the world? Uh, yes, they can be found all over the world. Um, although uh, the Chinese mantises, they don't do as well in a lot of the tropical environments, uh, the Chinese and European ones, they don't do as well in tropical environments. That's where you find the orchids uh, or the, uh, the devil's flower, which you never get a chance to look up the devil's flower mantis. They're awesome. <laughs> they look so cool. Uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, Chinese and European mantises, they don't do so well in, in tropical and in, in, like lower tropical environments. You don't see them there, um, but they are, uh, they easily invade places. So they easily get there, make a lot of babies and take over environments. Um, uh, how do you just, <laughs> uh, how do you distinguish them? Uh, if you look up pictures of them, you'll notice that um, the Chinese mantis, it is way sleeker. Um, the, uh, the, the Chinese mantis, you'll see that their, their uh, abdomen, like their, the middle segment of their body, um, that is fairly sleek. It's fairly just constant down. Uh, the European mantis, um, from what I have seen, the European mantis has almost, it, they're, they're uh, their abdomen has an almost vaguely shield-like uh, uh, width to it. Like you'll have the, the bottom part is straight down, but with almost a kind of um, widening near their back. Uh, that They're not full on like the shield mantis. There is a species called the shield mantis. They have a very, very wide abdomen. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the main major difference that's just noticeable between the Chinese and European are the uh, width of their abdomens. Let's see. So would a female in captivity be confused about when it is time to lay eggs? I could see that being possible uh, just by virtue of um, the fact that their, their, their temperature and their environment is just consistently the same. Um, but I have had all the females that I have owned, uh, they laid their eggs in fall just pretty consistently. So even if they might be confused by virtue of the fact that their environment's temperature and humidity isn't changing at all, um, time, like time's going to happen, time's going to pass. Eventually they're just by a lot, like Biological clock might be a good way of putting it. Eventually, that's going to happen. They're going to lay their eggs. Um, females can actually lay multiple oops. Uh, they can mate multiple times. Uh, so, yeah, they're eventually going to start laying their eggs, no matter how long they're in captivity. So, uh, oh, yes, of course. You said you raised them for... Wow. Yeah. What do you do with all the eggs that were called the mantises, the baby mantises that they I've never bred them in captivity. I have hatched an ooth in captivity. That was a mistake. I don't suggest anyone does that. <laughs> if you're going to hatch an ooth, if you decide that you're going to get into this hobby and you want to you want to hand raise them from birth and you're going to hatch an ooth, hatch it outside. Have something like uh, a um, a paper bag, 
uh, that you can leave outside in a dry place, um, have that out in spring. Uh, eventually they're going to hatch. There will probably be some remaining in the paper bag that you can take out and raise. Um, but oofs are really difficult to hatch in captivity. There are about a hundred little babies come out of those. It is next to impossible to to uh, to, to rouse like round them all up. Um, when I when I did that, when I I hatched an ooth uh, in an aquarium, uh, eventually, what I what I did was I just took the aquarium outside, took the lid off, and kind of let them do what they're going to do, <laughs> because there were just too many. They were finding all possible ways to escape from that from that aquarium. They, the, there were a lot of the, a lot of them that were getting caught in nooks and crannies that I, that I kept having to get out of nooks and crannies or like find find ones that have somehow gotten themselves stuck in something that got them killed. It was it, it was it was crazy. I, like I said, I do not advise hatching at youth uh, in captivity unless you're keeping exotics. If you're keeping exotics, firstly, don't breed them without a license. So exotics, uh, because mantises are so easily able to become uh, an invasive species and just help predator everything else around them, uh, exotics are illegal to keep in captivity if you're going to breed them. So you can't do that uh, unless you have a license. There is a there's a particular uh, method, you, particular um, set of steps you go through to get a license. Uh, and so on, and then you can breed them in captivity and you know hatch the youths. But even then, I believe there's some procedures that you have to go through. Uh, as far as I know, a lot of insectarians will take fertilized youths um, in order to you know hatch them themselves and study the and study the uh, the insects that hatch and whatnot. Um, but yeah. Uh, so I have a, a few other questions here. This one okay. I, I was going to, but my, my colleague took it down. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to the steak thing mentioned earlier, if you feed them dead insects in captivity, will they forego hunting? If the insect is cold, they won't eat it. Um, there's a lot of Crickets are a really good example of this too. Um, there are a lot of insects that attract bacteria really quick. And that bacteria, uh, they get incredibly dirty and uh, fill with bacteria when they die. Um, so if it is freshly dead, yeah, we'll, we'll probably eat it. It's still warm. Um, but uh, most, just on instinct alone, they're going to go ahead and hunt the ones that are moving. Um, however, yeah, if you're giving them freshly dead insects, uh, freshly killed prey, uh, I imagine that they would, just like when they eat steak, imagine they would forego hunting. Um, it is, uh, as I mentioned when I brought that up, it's kind of a dangerous thing to do in captivity uh, because if they forego hunting, it's gonna be really hard to feed them. Um, you're gonna be feeding them steak or in this case, freshly killed insects. You're gonna be feeding them that exclusively. So they're gonna be relying 100% on, on you for all of their feeding needs. Um, and that can be, I've never done it before, but I imagine that would be incredibly difficult. Yeah, this one's crazy. Have you ever heard of this? My brother and I caught a mantis when we were kids and put it in a goldfish jar. We caught many grasshoppers and put the food in the same jar for the mantis uh, to have as food. To our surprise, the grasshoppers ate the mantis. This is true. Uh, I, I've actually, uh, I've actually found that um, with crickets too. Uh, if you happen to have this is the, this is a really good example of it, but also a good example of it is um, one of one of the uh, when I was a kid, um, I begged my parents to let me keep a lizard. Um, they gave me a green anole, uh, and the uh, the anole that I had, he wasn't eating after a while, so I overfed him with crickets, and those crickets ate the anole. Uh, if you put enough 
Uh, if you put enough things like crickets, grasshoppers, if you put their like food that can bite and is an omnivore or a carnivore, uh, and there's enough of them to, over, to surround and overpower their predator, they will and they will also eat their predator. Um, so you always have to be careful. You cannot overfeed them. Um, that applies to mantises. That applies to reptiles. You just cannot overfeed. I found a praying mantis on my pepper plants today. What does that? What does it mean? Uh, it means that you have a nice garden that is full of delicious insects that they can eat. Um, if that's happening, I and you have mantises uh, in your garden, um, I suggest not using in insecticides. Just you don't uh, avoid insecticides and let the mantises eat all of the pests that would normally be eating your fruits and vegetables. Uh, insecticides will kill them, hands down. It will absolutely kill them. Um, but if you leave them be, they'll be beneficial pests for your garden. They'll eat a lot of the things that will be getting to your peppers, tomatoes, etc. Any questions from the audience? I am just want to uh, talk about the barium. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so we are going to be working on this um, over the next year. So. Yeah. Uh, over the next year, we're going to be. Indefinitely. Yes. <laughs> we're going to be building a vivarium, uh, a living vivarium. Um, and a vivarium is a contained ecosystem. Uh, you usually build them to host uh, particular reptiles, um, snakes, uh, geckos, etc. But you can also do it for mantises. Um, and what a vivarium entails, uh, will usually, whenever you see them, they'll usually have uh, holes along the sides for good uh, air filtration and whatnot. There'll be a lot of mechanical bits that lay a lot of like um, uh, mechanical bits and devices that you'll have inside for the purpose of uh, circulating air, keeping it humid, uh, keeping it at a, at a particular relative humidity. Um, just rogue aside, mantises require 30% humidity levels at all times. Uh, they won't molt well if it is lower than that, and not molting well can be the death of them. Um, I, but uh, vivariums, um, they are self-contained. They are uh, isolated ecosystems. You have What you'll do is you'll be growing some kind of plant in there, uh, in the soil. You're not going to be using any, um, they're not going to be using any uh, fertilizer. Uh, you should be growing it in good soil. Um, you're going to have a uh, layer of water beneath everything that is going to be used for uh, moving liquid into the plants. And you're also going to have uh, these tiny little mites um, and tiny little uh, pill bugs are a good example of these, actually. Uh, and you're going to have these living in the soil. These are going to be the cleanup crew. They're going to eat anything that's dead. They're going to eat any waste that your creature that's living in there might produce. Uh, and they, in an emergency, can also be used for nutrients for the creatures that's in there. Um, and by doing this, you essentially create uh, a consistently moving ecosystem. Um, there, are, there are ways to make it totally self-sufficient. Um, and that actually entails having your own water filtration system that can kind of keep going um, and with only having to repair uh, uh, repair some mechanical parts every so often. Um, that's really difficult. I don't know if we'll have the space or money to do that. Uh, it would be really cool if we could. Um, there are, Because in a lot of cases when people make stuff like that, uh, you can have a varium that just... You can just leave it alone for decades, and it will still be fine. It'll still it'll still have life. The plants will be fine. Uh, everything will be perfectly contained and living. So yeah, we'll be creating our own little world. Like we'll be godlike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Creating your own biome. So in that self-contained, what's the food source for mantis? We'll be we'll, that. That's one thing we'll have to add. Though. We'll have to like. We'll have to. We'll have to manually feed them. 
um, lots we'll of add crickets or blue bottle flies, or uh, when they're young, we can feed them. You had to point out our weakness. Yeah. So it's, the, it's like for in this case, it's the one thing that we have to the one thing we have to actually add to the varium. Uh, everything else in the varium is going to be self sustaining. Um, and any waste that the, that the mantis leaves from eating its prey, you don't have to clean it. The uh, little mites in the in the soil do all that for you. Um, let's see, so uh, one question here: uh, Since you're keeping the mantis in the library, does the humidity level needed to keep them healthy and happy get in the way of keeping library books away from human places? It's actually a very good question. That is. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I, I would say it's 30%. It's 30% humidity. That's the perfect level for paper. It is? Okay. For, yeah, for our final reason to see why keep the, the humidity of paper at the same yeah. level between 35 and 40. Okay. Humidity, so it's actually um, it's great for our books. <laughs> well, excellence. Uh, Aaron has the answer to that one. Thank you. <laughs> before, before we run out of time, and we're, we're pretty much out of time. You can name our manises. Uh, we have a contest going on. You can do it online on our website, or you can leave the name, your name and contact today. If you want to enter the contest, uh, we're giving away a prize on July 15th at the People's University for the winning name. What we're going to do is each of us will select our favorite, the two winning names, and uh, then our staff will vote on the two winners. And uh, you'll win uh, a Manistine prize and uh, a gift certificate. So just, just leave it with us today. You can actually use one of those forms over by the box there and leave it in the box if you want. And you can do it online as well, right? Online, there's a form to search for Mantis. Um, you'll find it. And then uh, I guess one last thing, uh, just, to, just to remind you, if anyone happens to want any of the research that I can provide, uh, let myself, when I'm at the reference desk, or Sean know, uh, give your email address or any way that I can send it to you. Um, and I will absolutely uh, provide any of, the inf any of the research or information that uh, I have uh, presented to you today. I didn't think you should be called brain names at all. Are you dare anyone to say that? Uh, that actually is a specific species. Oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I have misspoken in calling them all mantises. Uh, mantis is only a particular group. Uh, the, the plural of them is mantids. Um, and that covers their whole group of species. Uh, but the praying mantis is a very particular species. Is it mantis religiosa? Um, no, we have uh, Tinodorus nisus, the uh, Chinese mantis. But I mean, most people call them praying mantises because they all have the same posture. They all have that, that, that prayer-like posture with their forelimbs. Uh, so many people call them that, but uh, yeah, actually uh, praying mantis is a specific species. All right, thanks, Nate. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for the uh, comments and questions. Don't forget that Thursday we continue our People's University Bugs and People series with butterflies. So a very different incentive.